and welcome to the Ken McElroy Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. Hey guys, what's happening? So how is everyone today? I already noticed people are already talking about our topic. Yeah, welcome. Monday, one day. Yeah, uh, and if it's the Zillow crash or the market crash. But before we get into that. Yeah, yeah. we're going to definitely have some ideas around that topic. And I know a lot of you do too. So can't wait to hear what you have to say. Yep, definitely. And um, so for those that joined my webinar slash training last week, that was awesome. Nice job on that. I Boy, know. It yeah, went really hundreds well. of people and we've got well, lots thought, of views on it. You know, it was funny. I thought it was going to be like 15, 20 minutes and it was over an hour. Yeah, well, by the way, guys, as you know, she definitely knows what she's talking about, but she was super prepared, a lot more than I typically am. So she's she's the A student I between us. Student we average of a B the, of the, of the for group. sure. <laughs> But no, thank you for joining. Um, we're actually going to be doing another webinar next month with um, someone he specializes in wholesaling properties. Yeah, yeah, we've gotten uh, some requests around that. So it, you know, it's a it's a business that a lot of people make a lot of money. In. Yeah, and you know the cool part about wholesaling is you can start with having no money. Yeah, and we and know a lot of people that have done. Well, that. that's most. That's how most people start. Yeah, that's so why they start in wholesaling. If you guys are anything <laughs> like us? We all started with no money. Right. So wholesaling is awesome. So it's kenmacquarie.com slash webinar. I'll be hosting, but um, somebody else will be presenting. So yeah. he's going to be the expert. I'm just the host, but it's going to be a great, great uh, training for those of you. And it's free for those of you that want to get started in wholesaling. Um, kenmacquarie.com slash webinar to sign up. And it is Q&A. So you come with your questions. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely. The, kind of the whole point. Exactly. To learn and to ask questions. So this weekend, we had a fun weekend. I know. My hand's almost, my hand is, uh, like, guys, look, I ripped open my hand. I get my stitches out today. For those that didn't uh, know, uh, <laughs> didn't join us last week, Ken fell up an unmoving escalator <laughs> and he cut his hand. Yeah, so, right. I did. I fell forward into mm -hmm. an escalator that wasn't moving. Yep, yep. Don't ask. Yeah, but no drinks were involved. No. <laughs> Wow, why would that? I, I, George Gammon behind me, and uh, no, Robert Kiyosaki behind me, and George Gammon in front of me. George w went to the ER. Yeah, with the me. two of you are in Robert's the ER. Robert's like, whatever. You well, Robert you. almost passed out with the blood. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so that was. But then this this weekend though, we did some Halloween parties. That was super fun. Yeah, Cardinal game Thursday. They well, lost let's talk to the about Packers. the Cardinal game. Yeah, that was a good game. Uh, yeah, we're Cardinal fans, of course. Even though I'm from Seattle and you're from Ohio, there's no. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Pittsburgh fan, but I cheer for the That's Cardinals because I live here. But uh, yeah, that was a good game. We went with friends that were Packers fans and yes. uh, we had to listen to them all the way. Disappointing home. ending. Yeah. But um, but then the Halloween parties, yeah, we Halloween too, parties fun. were fun. We went to four. You were supposed to be Squid Games, but your costume didn't come Sitting in. Sitting offshore, Long Beach, with <laughs> everybody we, else's stuff. As we talked last last week about supply chain issues, Ken firsthand experience. <laughs> I that did. With I his ordered Halloween my costume. Uh, first world problems, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, ordering a, a Halloween costume <laughs> that didn't show up. Um, so I improvised. You did. You were the Riddler. I was. And I was Harley Quinn, and we were a matching couple yeah. costume. Well, somehow we figured even though out. we did not plan. Somebody that. else had to point that out. Yeah. He said, oh, well, you guys are a good matching couple costume. Oh, that's right. I guess we are. Or, yeah, and it wasn't Marvel. Um, it was DC. I forget, but the kids were telling us yesterday. Yeah. But um, so. Let's jump in. Well, first, we have to start with our Real Estate Investing oh, Master Course right. okay. tip of the week. And our tip of the week that comes straight from our Master Course, which is available on KenMacroy.com, is before you buy a property, you need to determine its net operating income. So that should be whenever you guys ask us, should we buy in Houston? What do you think of the Miami market? Yeah. It all comes down to the net operating income. Does it cash flow? Does it not cash flow? Yeah, That's it. it's an important thing. Like people, they want a quick answer, but really. And by the way, the starting net operating income is is uh, is literally exactly what the property is operating at today. So whatever the seller has right now today whatever the property generates today that's the number and then the the magic of course becomes on what can you bring that to so that's when we buy properties we're trying to increase that net operating income that net operating income number and that's what creates value definitely definitely and a lot of people on here are talking about wholesaling they're saying you know they wholesale and i invite you guys to join the webinar anyways i mean this guy is an expert he can answer any questions for you you're probably going to learn something and you know those of you that want to get started in wholesaling yeah if you guys want to get in the game and you don't have to have money it's a great way to learn 
And, yep. and of course, eventually you want to use your own and, and even raise money through syndication. It's a step. That's all it is. Yep. And before we start, hit the damn like button, okay? I noticed 17 of you did it before we even got on. I appreciate that. The rest of you, hit the like the button. The damn like button. The damn That's like right. button. I'm a little feisty today. I can see that. Um, <laughs> okay. So today we are talking about what is going on with Zillow. Yeah. I, I, I've done a fair amount of research on this, and you have too. We, mm -hmm. we, uh, we had a, uh, we'd be remiss in not um, mentioning Misty. Who, yes, our friend Misty. Our, our friend Misty <laughs> sent us some stuff on this as well. We we got a lot of stuff from you guys on this. Thank you, Misty. Yes, uh, this, we got it we, yesterday we, morning. Yeah, we felt like it was going to be a good topic for us. And um, so yeah, let's jump in on that. Yeah. So why don't so, you do a summary of uh, just for those yeah. who don't know what's happening? So basically, Zillow is fire sealing their houses. So Zillow went through this whole spree where they were buying a bunch of houses, paying over asking price for a bunch of houses. And now they're fire sealing all their houses in the Phoenix, Houston and Atlanta areas, which is predominantly where they bought. Um, they're losing money on about two thirds of the houses and 93 percent of the houses in Phoenix are selling at a loss. But let's back up. Well, but it sounds really crazy. Yeah, but, but Zillow duped everyone. At first, they said, OK, give us all your data and advertise and put all your stuff up on here. And then they started competing against everybody. Right. Like, so that's so for me, I think this is awesome because this is like the big guy, uh, the big guys at this point with the managed money, you, they're they're uh, it, well, they're clearly showing one of their hands, which, which is we don't know yet, but uh, we're going to talk about it anymore. But either they they definitely overpaid, which um, a small local little speedboat investor is not going to do. Yeah. Well, they did it to flip. So, like, you yeah, don't overpay and then flip. I know, I know. And, and there is a way to do that. And we're going to get into that more. But I, I think it's it's actually, it serves them right. Yeah. That's all I have to say about that. I, I mean, you know, they basically, uh, and they're using their own data, mm -hmm. I think. It looks to me like to potentially manipulate the markets a little bit. Well, and what was interesting from what I read was that they essentially were pay overpaying for a house, yep. but then adjusting the Zestimate yeah, so it didn't look like they point. overpaid for the <laughs> Wouldn't house. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to do this? <laughs> Some people would call that self-dealing. Right, uh, right, you know. right. But and essentially, that's what it that's what it is. Insider trading, whatever you want to call it, they buy and then they adjust their own price. So right. um, that's a market mover and, and serves them right, by the way. And they're losing money in a lot of markets. Not not every market is uh, are they selling at a loss, by the way. So you can't right. just say Zillow's doing this. But what's what is the truth is there there's definitely plenty of markets that they're taking losses. Well, it's important to point out, though, even though this makes a great headline, they're not selling it that much of a loss. So they're not fire sailing the houses that are like, you know, like 20 percent off. Essentially, I think the average was about 10 grand that they were losing per house, um, which is a lot of I mean, that adds up. It's a lot of money, but it's not like monumentally. And it's not over. The market. It, they're, they're, you know, guys, this is this is started. Uh, it's not like just didn't start this week, but uh, it's not over. And don't forget, there has to be buyers of those houses. Right. So in order for the whole thing to, to the full circle, there has to be an exit. So. Yeah, so there's lots of reasons why and we're going to get into that in a minute. Yeah. And, you know, so they're blaming it on a uh, labor shortage, which in some ways it could possibly be. Because if they're trying to flip these homes and they can't get people in to flip them in a timely manner, that could be a small part of the issue. Right. right. So uh, but here's the thing. And we talk about this a lot on KimAcroy.com. This is the clearest example of I'm going to buy it and it's going to go up next week. Well, right. And that is a bad strategy. And, and so what's really cool about it is they're, they're um, you know, one of the biggest buyers mm -hmm. is is actually showing their hand right now. And so, so this is why we continue to talk about cash flow, passive income. This is, this is literally a, I hope it goes up. Uh, uh, next week or or a month later or a year later. Right, because when they bought these homes, the market was accelerating up. And the market's still going up but a lot slower of a pace. And sometimes it's kind of leveling out. And they're, you know, when they adjust in the flip and then the additional cost for all of this stuff to flip. That's I mean, the, the labor, That's the, the supplies. Thing, guys. There's hold times, trust me. And, and, you know, don't forget, like, 
we don't know whether or not they finance these or whether they're using a, a line of credit, or, you know, and, and either way, it's the same thing. They're, they're, they're using somebody else's money to buy these. Uh, the other thing that could be happening is they might have, they might be short on cash going into this, this last quarter. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know. I mean, when I say short on cash, I mean operationally. I'm not talking about access to lines and other money and raising extra capital. I'm talking about operationally. And so we're going back to the basics here. But when a company has more expenses than income, that means that operationally they're negative. And so what happens sometimes is they, they start to sell off assets or in, uh, think of a manufacturing company, they might sell off inventory or you know whatever it is. So this these moves are, uh, so the, these properties could be considered inventory and uses of cash. So they sit on their balance sheet as an asset. They're not cash flowing and they're not income producing. Right, right. <laughs> Well, you know, Colby, we'll have to look more into this, but he's saying BlackRock owns a major portion of Zillow. So that would be interesting if that's true. We'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah. And I, that doesn't surprise me. Bla- you know, BlackRock, has, uh, they, they tried to buy my company, as, as some of you guys know. And, and they're, they're, they have their hands in a lot of stuff, including real estate. And by the way, in 2008, uh, this happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zillow wasn't around. But in 2008, a lot of homes went back to the banks, 8, 9, 10. And, you know, you know the stories been you know it's all over the internet just go look if you guys are are kind of new to the industry and what happened was big big groups uh, private equity and institutional equity were buying from the banks they were buying what they would call their toxic assets very different during that time because by this time they had already made it all the way back to the bank so they were they were actually dealing with the bank themselves they weren't actually doing it on the open market like they are now the, so, but they made a lot of money back in 2008, 9, and 10. So they were buying tens of thousands of homes back then, as you would, and then they sold them off. And the problem, which back then is the same problem that Zillow has now, and that is property management, local labor, carrying costs. The, the, this, you know, real estate is a business, guys. It's not a stock. Right. Well, that's another thing, right? So like Zillow kind of got into a space they maybe didn't know enough about and they thought, oh, we'll just come in, we'll flip the property, we'll sell it for more. But there's property taxes, there's HOA, there's maintenance, there's all these things. And there's carrying costs on the money. Yeah, and there's, right. And, and, and not to mention the fact that we ha- we don't know the, 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 the real numbers, but, but it's a use of cash. So, so when you when you're buying all these houses, you're using cash for other things, and it's sitting in in these assets. And so, there somebody at the corporate level, uh, one that they're like, they maybe they really do because what everybody's fearing about is, is this it, you know is the market tipping, and do they know something that we don't know? That's really what right. That's everyone who thinks does Zillow know something that we don't know? Essentially, yeah. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I I, I don't think they're that smart. I mean, they, I just don't No, yeah. Listen, they're, why are they different than somebody else that's in the local market or, you know, I know they have data, but you guys are looking at the data. And so, and yes, maybe they have some extra data that, that, that isn't as transparent, but so does realtor.com. So does open door. So, so are some of these other I buyers and uh, those other I buyers are not displaying the same behavior. I think it's a use of cash and a labor issue and a, and a, you know, kind of a mismanagement of the whole thing. Yeah. Right. I would agree with you. I think that they got, you know, in below their skis and they just were yeah, above I, their skis. I and would just, do it. Yeah. Like, like if I, if I was running Zillow and, and we, we, um, and, and I was looking at the cash and let's say operationally, who knows, you know, how does, how's Zillow really doing financially? That's really what people should be looking at. Is right. And where how are, are they, they making their money? Yeah, they're, they're on a massive growth spurt right now. And they were throwing everything at the wall. And, and so we want to get involved in this. Yes, and that, yes, and, yeah. yes. And so all of those things, as you, you have to look at those and say, OK, is it working or is it not working? Now, they might be, which which is what we're going to kind of talk about, too. Don't forget, we just had the eviction moratorium. I know the forbearance piece got extended, right? Well, yeah, we're going to talk about yeah. that. Yeah, and 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 um, so, but at the end of the day, things are kind of normalizing, and then now people have to pay their mortgages, and people are starting to foreclose. Yeah, or sell. Or sell, and so we're starting to see that. And whenever you have an increase of supply, 
then you very well could see a flattening or a declining in prices. Definitely. And uh, Matt from YouTube says, um, people forget that market cycles exist. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everything doesn't just go up. Right, it, right, right. it is amazing to me. I mean, if you're if, if you got into real estate 10 years ago, you think this is the way it is. <laughs> right. Trust me, Definitely. it is not. Well, and Ricardo said, Ricardo said something interesting. He said he has a pending deal, but he's starting to doubt it because of all this. Ah, yeah. But as long as it's cash flowing, I mean, this is why we, we preach cash flow and not flipping. I know you can make money from flipping. Some of you make money from flipping, but you really are kind of betting that nothing's right. going to happen with the market in between you getting the house flipped and sold. This is the age old issue, guys. Fast money versus long-term passive income. That's really what this is about. Capital gains versus cash flow. That's what this is about. Zillow was all about a capital gain strategy. Buy low, sell high, period. And then now they're realizing that maybe they're not going to see that high or maybe their operational costs are so much that they have to, they have to exit or maybe they just need cash operationally. Mm -hmm. So think of um, during when the pandemic hit, the rental car industry got decimated. What you're experiencing right now is the rental car folks like Enterprise, Budget, Hertz, they sold off their inventory to get cash. That's what they did. And that's why rental cars right now are so tough because now we have a car supply issue and they can't get more. But, you know, uh, so think of that. It's a supply demand issue. And so, you know, we have this we have this issue right now where. I think that that Zillow needed the cash and they probably screwed up their whole business model around this. Yeah, definitely. And I also think, you know, there are people are asking, you know, why didn't they sell it for, you know, the value? For a loss. And yeah, why they sell it for a loss? Because they have to. Because they have, to, they need it <laughs> off their books. I mean, because if they're financing this, especially if it's a higher interest financing, every month that thing sits there, it just loses money. And so for them to try to get it off their yeah. books quicker, I mean, if they're only losing like 10 grand, I mean, that could be, you know, a big portion of their interest payment for a month. Mark my so. words, guys. Something's going on over there. Like, maybe there's another round of funding coming. There's something happening. Maybe they got to do their quarterly earnings. And, y y you know, and one of the things that you have to have is a lot of cash and you have to show profit. Obviously, as you start to raise capital and grow as a company, all those things have to align. And if you used a bunch of your cash to buy a bunch of real estate, it's sitting there as an as a um uh, as an asset, but it's not liquid. And, right. and so they're turning it into liquidity. They're probably taking some short-term losses on some of them. But if you aggregate it all, they might be okay. They might just say, might be saying, I'm going to get out of the business. Well, so right, because if they're selling, they said in Atlanta, it's like, what, 63% at a loss. So they're still making money on a third of them. And Yeah, and Phoenix, are, they're, it's actually higher. But in other markets, they're actually making money. But they're definitely exiting. And what, what it's doing, of course, is flooding the market a little bit. In addition to that, you're going to start to see, I think, some of these forbearance um, folks, uh, they're going to start to have to pay. And as some of these lenders say, it's time it's time to pay. So all of that is going to hit. That's going to create additional supply. And what additional supply does is it it messes with the pricing because, yeah. you know, what we just experienced is not normal. You know, days on the market, multiple bids higher than listing price is not normal. That's not healthy. Right. And and so it's it's irrational exuberance, as they call it. You know, it's it's the herd mentality. And it's interesting to me that Zillow got caught up in it. And now they're, they've had to show their hand. Yeah. German said Zillow buying process was just flat out idiotic. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so right. Let's not forget about that. Like, like you guys think like, oh, this company is so sophisticated. They're so big. They're not any smarter than you guys. I'm right. telling you right now. Right. They're not. They're, uh, the, 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 the executive team at Zillow is so disconnected with what's happening in Phoenix. Trust me. You're right. They, you know, they're relying on somebody somewhere. And somebody got paid and compensated for buying all those houses in Phoenix, as an example, in Atlanta. And, and um, you know, who knows if they're still there. But the point is, um, it didn't work. Yeah, actually, um, one of our YouTube followers just said that Zillow bought his house from $15,000 over value. And now it's, you know... Uh, Back to his original listing price that they're selling it for. Yeah, so good, they bought it for more. Good and for now, you. Uh, good. Yeah. So you saw. So, but the issue I think you're going to have 
Think about that as they dump all these houses. Do we know the final number? Has anybody? No, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't as high as you think. It ah. was also like in Phoenix, it was like 250 homes as okay. of the other day. Okay. So it's not thousands, it's, but it is a decent Well, amount. it is nationally, though. Yeah. So, but what's, what's interesting to me is, you know, all of those have to have buyers. And now the difference is, is uh, who's going to buy those? Now, it could be another institution. Absolutely. Maybe it is. Or it might be individuals that now have to go qualify and get loans and all that kind of stuff at the same time. Um, I think I think that um, uh, you know I think I I don't think this is the, the end of this though. No, def we'll definitely keep following this. And you know, some furry said something interesting on YouTube. He said he has been a flipper and he looks at all the properties that he flipped and he wished he was a buy and hold now. He regrets uh, that. Yeah, yeah. It's listen, guys. I totally get it. Ho start with wholesaling, then flipping. You know, if you guys are coming out of, you know, something, you don't have a lot of cash and you're just trying to fund your lifestyle, I get that. But th you got to switch to get disciplined. You have to do that because at the end of the day, reoccurring revenue is what Zillow doesn't have. This is what their problem is. It's not if if those properties cash flowed, they would not be selling them. But they're relying on them being higher than what they bought them for. And what we don't know are all the extra costs that are sitting in there. I, yeah. In the articles I read, some of these homes they didn't even touch. Yeah, no, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't do anything. a lot of homes they didn't even touch. So they basically bought them, they just sat, and then they relisted them. Which, well, we know how hard it is to get labor. Oh, it's just so to get hard, anything. guys. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys know. Like, it, even as managed as we are as a firm, we have a heck of a time. I mean, you, you know, my son bought a home. He moved in it uh, two months ago. Mm -hmm. He still doesn't have his appliances. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, he has appliances in there, but they're no, no 25 one. years old yeah. or whatever. So and, you know, so these are things, these supply chain issues are real. Yeah, but but somebody should have thought that through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This wasn't like a shocker. We all know that. So. Michael Shane said uh, something interesting. He he said, I'd like to listen to Zillow's earnings call. There you go. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's where you need to be because they have to show that, guys. Right. And so that's really where your head needs to be. There's some short term cash issue happening. And um, you think about how much money they're basically getting. They're, they're creating some liquidity. And so it's going to be interesting to see what the next move. I keep your eye on Zillow because um, either they're having real problems, which I doubt because they're pretty heavily funded and BlackRock's involved, but, or they're repositioning for something else that they're going to do. Yeah. And then this will all make sense. And they might've just felt like they got in over their head. And and maybe, it was just yeah. And maybe they're know. just in the wrong business. And this is good for the market guys. We don't want you guys. I, you know, one of the things that we get in our channels, we get people saying all these big groups are coming in. You don't want a, a company that's, that's uh, wall street finance coming in and competing against you. Right. I mean, that's actually, let's don't forget, they're part of the problem. They're part of the reason that the, these prices went up. Right. You know, not the problem, but they're certainly part of the problem. When you have that many people bidding and you have somebody like Zillow that, that is, um, let's say you're the seller of your house. <laughs> you got Zillow and then you got me. Like, who are you going to go with? Like, right, exactly. I mean, you know. Well, like, and they can pay 10 grand more, no problem. And, For you, yeah, it might and, be. And, you know. and I'm like, well, I got to get finance. I got to this. I got to that. Well, who are you going to, you know, of course you're going to sell the Zillow. You don't care. Money's money. So you know, now you're starting to see the, the, the repercussion of that. Definitely. And we're going to talk about if we see a market crash coming here in a second. But first, make sure you slam the like button. Really helpful to us. Secondly, we are doing a webinar. I actually don't know the date, but it's going to be uh, later in November on wholesaling. So go ahead and sign up, KenMcElroy.com yeah, we'll slash wholesaling. We'll put the date up on here. KenMcElroy.com slash webinar. Yeah, and we'll stick the date on here for you guys. Definitely. So do we see this whole Zillow thing? Are they predicting a real estate crash? Should we think that that's right around the corner? Or you first. Not? No, I think Zillow has a problem. Now, I do. I think the market is on very unsteady ground right now. However, I don't think it has anything to do with Zillow. You have to go back to the original fundamentals again. So when people want to talk about a market crash, they want like the U.S. market to crash or, you know, but really what you have to look at is there are definitely markets that were already trending down before the Zillow news. 
already. There are people moving out of cities and towns right now as we speak based on a number of things from governmental policies to, to businesses closing to safety issues to weather issues to retirement issues to uh, work from home issues or whatever they are. So all that stuff's happening. Okay, so you have to take a look at each town organically. Like, like right now, North Carolina is on fire. Florida's on fire. Texas is on fire generally. Not all this, the entire state. Of course, there are areas in Texas that aren't. But, but uh, you have to look at what's going on independently. And then you have to take a look at um, how this is going to impact uh, over the long term or the short term. So one of the things I don't particularly think that Phoenix, as an example, which is the market that we're in right now, is going to be impacted by this Zillow stuff. Right. It's going to get absorbed. And there's still a lot of people moving here right now because, you know what, you can buy a nice home here for 300 grand. It's getting harder, but yeah. yeah. It is harder, but you can. Not in yep. Scottsdale. Right. But definitely in Phoenix and Mesa and, and, and some of the surrounding areas, Peoria. So this is a very affordable area. And so you have to be looking at those kinds of things. Yeah. So, and you know, Scott just mentioned forbearance, loosening the market. So something that's interesting that we actually kind of missed, we just looked at this morning, is that they pushed forbearance out another six months. Sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> Didn't really uh, make many headlines, yeah. but they did. Yep, yep. I know. So, you know, so what that means, guys, is that if people are behind that, that they uh, now can kick that can down the road even more. That actually could be a problem if the market does turn. So there's a bunch right. of things. Let, you know, let's go up a little higher to 30,000 foot. We still have massive unemployment and labor issues. So we have a lot of people out of work that don't want to work for whatever reason. Right. Mm hmm. Even I'm trying to, uh, we're trying to find multiple positions. We have 38 open positions at our company right now. Right. And so and if you're looking for a job, hop yeah, on MC yeah, companies. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know, in all, all over the map. So all over the, you know, different States and corporate office. And I'm talking about accounting and, you know, some assistant and, you know, some, we have, we have, we have new positions, uh, investor relations, all that kind of stuff. It's hard. And, and w our wages, we've had to, we've had to go out with higher on higher wages and, and, um, and, and we haven't had a lot of applicants, which has been really interesting. And and we are one of the top by uh, six, eight years in a row. The uh, Arizona Republic uh, said we are one of the top employers in the state. Mm -hmm. We have a great culture, all that kind of stuff. I'm not trying to brag. What I'm trying to say is that we historically have never had it. We've had more people trying to work for us than not. And uh, so it's always been pretty easy for us. Now it's been really, really difficult. We just hired a full-time person, full-time as a recruiter, employee, you know, to go out and mm -hmm. recruit. The point is this, there's all these other bigger factors happening. And, and I think that with that and the, the supply chain issues, um, you know, you, you, you need to take a look at what's going on from a supply, you know, as people are moving around and, and what's really happening. And I think that you're, we, we have some big affordability issues coming. Definitely. You, you know, things are going up, guys. Yeah. And, and uh, there was an article in the Washington Post last week that the average uh, per month is $179, I think it was. Just Google it. It's $179 per person on the average higher than it was uh, even a year ago. So what, that's a lot of money. That's, uh, you know, that's almost a couple, that's a couple grand. Right. Um, that, that all of a sudden is gone. I mean, that, that's $2,000 more to live on the average. And I know you can, you can get into the weeds here and, and, you know, assassinate me for, you know, little things here and there. But the point is things are going up. And I think, I, I think that things are going to slow down for the housing, um, in particular. Well, you know, they're not extending the, um, you know, they always say that they're extending the forbearance so people can keep their homes because that sounds really nice. But they're extending the forbearance because they know it's going to be a disaster because there's a lot of people that are behind on their mortgages. And they're hoping that in six months, maybe this will turn around. Maybe they'll extend it again. And that's why it's so hard on this channel to predict when the crash will be because when the government keeps doing things like extending forbearance, it's almost like prolonging the inevitable. It is. <clears throat> you know? One of the things that... If you look at history, one of the things that the government uses to control inflation is interest, interest rates. So typically, when inflation's rampant, 
then they can adjust inflate in interest rates. And so, but right now they can't adjust them down anymore. Right, right, right. So the problem that they have is that interest rates are at all time lows and inflation is apparently not transitory like everybody keeps saying that it is. Exactly. Right? I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel transitory to me. No, no. George Gammon just did a video that inflation's permanent. Wow. <laughs> so, but the, the point is, is I, I think that if, well, one of the things to watch is as, as you know, the government has to make a decision. Do they let things run on the inflation side or do they manipulate the interest rates to, 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 to calm it down? Right. If they do that, and this is the point, then what will happen is that'll put a screeching halt on purchases because um, for cars, for houses, because the cost of debt the, 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 uh, gets higher and the mortgage payment or your car payment goes up. And all of a sudden at the same time when things are already going up, that's actually what the Fed's most concerned about right now. Yep, definitely. And Michael Shane uh, said that there is a call for Zillow at 5 p.m. Eastern time today, which is just I would jump on that call, guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who knows? It, you know, it'll be a spin. It'll be the spin doctors for sure. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. You know, because there's a lot of this. This is a very interesting uh, PR move for those guys. They have to do this. Because uh, I don't, I'd be interested. I haven't even looked. I wonder what their share prices are. If any of you guys know, you should put that on here. I'd love to know. It, you know what's their what happened to the valuation? Because there's a lot of speculation. This is no different than, um, you know, there does, doesn't appear to be a market crash. So why why is a company like this exiting all their real estate? That's really the million dollar question. Exactly, and that'll help you understand that. Um, so we're going to move into our premium questions. Make sure you guys sign up for premium, kenmalcroy.com forward slash premium. You can try seven days for free with the code on the screen. And um, you get to ask Ken a question. And we make sure to answer all of our premium questions. Yeah, those are fun. I appreciate uh, the questions that you guys are sending in. We're growing by premium every week. It's exciting, actually. And we have a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, we got our advisors kicking off. So we, we, we have a tax advisor, which you guys have met with Eric Freeman. We have a legal advisor with uh, Mauricio Raul. Uh, and his videos are coming out. And so you guys are going to start to see a lot more on both the free and the premium side and uh, and be able to ask them questions. So I'm excited about the, all that. Definitely. So KenMacRoy.com forward slash premium to try out your free seven days. So first question comes from Kevin. What is your morning routine to get your day started? Ooh, that's a good one. So might surprise some of you. The very first thing I do is I get up and I drink a big glass of water with lemon. Now, I know this is getting minute, but it's the truth. Then I, 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 I take some athletic greens. And athletic greens, I'm not obviously a spokesperson for athletic greens, but I've done some research on that. And, um, and that gives me all my vitamins and all that kind of stuff. Then I go stretch and then I meditate. So that's the first thing I do. I don't get on my phone. I don't jump on the computer. Then after all that... Um, you know, then I kind of ease into my day and I'll, by the way, all that takes, you know, maybe a half hour to 45 minutes at the most. Um, then, it, um, typically if, uh, I, I usually try not to do too much in the mornings, although recently I have been, but our typical routine is hitting the gym. Uh, we leave around seven 30 and, uh, get back to the house by nine, nine 15. And then I kind of start my day each and every day. And then it's, pretty much packed most yeah. most of the days um so that's that's pretty much it usually the gym at least three days maybe four but i'm a big believer that you just got to move right yep. yeah definitely so our next question comes from nick he said would you buy a hundred year old home as a rental property the condition seems okay I had I had one. So is it rental though? <laughs> no, but I could have. They told me for Iron Man I could have rented it for twenty five grand for the week. Uh, it was right on the water and it was right Coeur on yeah, yeah. In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, you know, the age of the home is uh, obviously has a lot to do with the with the maintenance, but it, it's the location. So in my particular case, it was built in nineteen oh five, and everybody loved this location. Obviously, people did even over a hundred years ago. So. Now, inside of the house, different issue. You know, I had the galvanized pipes and, you know, with the old tube and knob wiring and all that kind of stuff, which I had to do and redo. 
But uh, for me, uh, I didn't feel like um, it was a bad investment at all. I made, uh, I netted over two million more. But you did sell it for more. Yeah, it wasn't a rental. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. But it could have been. Is my point. Yeah. I, I, and, and I, um, but again, back to location. So I, I think the age. Uh, if you're if if you're struggling with the age, it has to do only with the operational costs. So if the operational cost of maintaining the house at the age that it's in uh, outweigh the cash flow, then then I would probably pass. But the location is everything because I would rather have an old house in a great location than a brand new house in a bad location. Well, yes, for sure. So. A lot of people are asking about the job openings for MC Company. You can just yeah. go to the MC Company website and you can probably yeah. find them there. Yeah, www.mccompanies.com and, um, and and just uh, send those. Thank you, by the way. And uh, and or by Facebook. Or how, how were you getting them before? They're just emailing them directly to my email. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So our next premium question comes from Jing. He asked, when you invest as a limited partner, do you hold title in a single member LLC for the best asset protection? Great question. So um, just the traditional structure, first of all, there's a GP, which is typically the person put together the deal, and then the LPs, which are the money, uh, and they come together into one partnership. And um, that's called a general partnership where the LPs are limited partners and the GP is a general partner. So, so um, to answer your question, when it comes to asset protection, one of the greatest, obviously, is Garrett Sutton, who talks a lot about asset protection. And so what happens is when you invest in your name, let's say you invest in six deals in your individual name, and then, God forbid, you, you run a red light, you hit somebody, and they get hurt, and they sue you. So now what they can do is they go after all six of your investments because they're in your name. And <clears throat> so the whole point of putting anything in your name um, is not necessarily good. You, what you want is that extra asset protection layer. So it doesn't matter if it's an LP or it's your own home or whatever it is, you, you know, people are going to sue you, your individual name. So for me, I don't have anything in my name, not one thing. And so what happens is uh, if that ever happens, then people sue you, but then they sue the, the, the LLC. Right. And that's your asset protection. Now, they can still, what's called pierce the corporate veil, they can still get through that. But instead of just suing you personally and having access to all your assets, imagine having six different LLCs for those six different investments. They would have to sue all of those in order to get to them. So it's an asset protection play. And um, uh, I think that uh, for more information on that, you should go to Garrett Sutton. He's got a, uh, uh, how to, actually he's got a book out, a Rich, Rich Advisor book called Protect Your Assets. <laughs> um, German uh, said that banks are throwing blind forbearance at homeowners. Uh, this is on YouTube, by the way. Um, but German has to remember as well that all this money does have to be paid back. Yeah, actually. yeah, you're right. That is happening. It's been happening for a while, as we all know. And uh, don't forget, they still owe it. Yeah, definitely still owed. Okay, so Joe from Premium. When it comes to infinite returns, what's your timeline for achieving an infinite return? And do you or your investors, um, what, what's the expectation of the infinite return on a new project as well as the value add? Really, really good question. Insightful question. So first of all, for those of you guys who don't know, an infinite return means if I take a hundred grand from somebody and, and I give it back to them in a certain period of time and still own the asset, then they've gotten their return of capital back. That's an infinite return. So they actually own the asset with no investment. Uh, so, so <clears throat> With every single deal, that's what we try to accomplish. But what's, what happens in, in the, say, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 time frame, it was a lot easier to, to do. So, uh, it, you know, we were doing that in three years, four years. Now, with the rising prices, it's a lot harder. And so it might, it's pushing the timelines out for the infinite return. But the, the point is, that's what our goal is always. So as I raise capital from investors, my entire goal is to give it back to them. And that should be yours. 
your goal is to give them back their original equity now and continue to hold the asset. So you want the asset to cash flow but then you also want to increase the value. So there's two kinds of equity as we talk about a lot. One is market equity, which means kind of what Zillow does. Zillow says, I'm gonna buy something and I hope that it goes up or they manipulate their website or their Zillow estimate or whatever it's called, <laughs> it, whatever it's called, and they, and they make it go up themselves. But the market's smart, it's gonna do what it does. That's, that's the market. Two is forced equity. And forced equity means that you actually have a plan. You actually, like you think of buying a vacant building and putting a tenant in it. What you've done is you've increased the value of that property because it now comes with a tenant that actually has cash flow. So a million dollar property, as an example, might be worth two with, with when it's full of tenants and it's actually paying. So, so <clears throat> when you have that, then you go back and you do a cash out refinance. So you use debt twice. You use debt to buy it, then you use debt to replace out the debt and the original investment from the first investment. So that is the point. And um, <clears throat> so it's really difficult to say how long it takes because each asset is very, very different. I'm doing a video today on how I did it on a billboard. Yeah, well, that'll be released probably in a week or two. Yeah, yeah, but, but the point is, is that it, you know, on that one, it took uh, a few years. So, right. uh, but not every asset is, is the same. Definitely. Um, Matt, you had asked about a trust versus an LLC. It's best to talk about it to your, um, to your tax accountant because we don't want to get too much into the details on this because that's not really our focus. No, but I will, I'll just touch on that. So I have trusts and LLCs both. Well, he just so you know, to clarify, he said to put the, put it in the trust and then assign it to an LLC. Yeah, so now we're getting into kind of a state planning. Yeah. So uh, the trust means that you don't own it. That's right. what a trust does. So I have a trust, and when I move stuff to my trust, that means I'm no longer the owner of the of the asset. Right. Under an LLC, you actually still own it. So, um, but um, it, it you know we're getting into some complexities around estate planning. But the entire purpose of a trust is to move stuff into there and let it grow in the trust but it essentially means like so i i do a lot of estate planning every year guys well, you know you can right now before biden you we can move up to 11 million dollars a year into a trust <clears throat> and i've been doing that so that money is sitting over here in a trust and i cannot even be the trustee which uh, because right. that that way the irs can come back and say well you just moved your stuff but now you're the trustee of your own trust that's not really a true trust so you got to be careful around trust but trusts are very very good tax planning tools okay so first name last name is saying that they have several units <laughs> rented way below market are there any laws or rules for increasing rent closer to market rents in arizona no you can no. increase it a lot yeah 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 th th this is a uh, it's a borderline ethical issue, uh, in uh -huh. my opinion. You know, you you know, we we Ross and I, my partner, we we have a lot of senior properties. So we have four or five senior properties. When I say senior properties, I mean two to three hundred unit properties. We've made a conscious decision not to really jack the rents on those because a lot of those seniors aren't fixed income. So you know, but the there is nothing that says that you can't raise your your rents to market. And, and so you got to take a look at um, the whole scenario. Even you have rents below market. Yeah. But, I mean, I am going to raise them, but yes, yeah, but you, but you have tenants to pay and they're, they're good and they've been there a while. I had a tenant for nine years at one of my assets and I always had him a few hundred dollars under market and I never cared because he fixed stuff, he did stuff and it was a win-win and we, I would talk to him about it and say, Hey, you know, his name was Bruce. I said, Bruce, like, you know, yeah, 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 Ken. Well, I appreciate you working with me. And he just, he took care of the place. He took care of the yard, took care of, you know. So uh, it's just, as, but the answer, to answer your question directly, there is nothing that says that you can't raise it to market. Definitely. And some free, um, good, uh, a lot of people are asking, is now a good time to buy? And some free kind of summed it up. He said, anytime is a good time to buy as long as the numbers work. As long as the math works. So Scott has a good question from Premium. He said he's exhausted his own startup funds, but friends and family keep offering to invest with him. He's thinking of accepting, but he's a little bit nervous. Should he get a syndication attorney involved? 
And should he accept their money as a loan or as an investment? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, for, there's a bunch of stuff here, Scott. The first one is, um, you better be right on this one. Yeah, you got to be pretty yeah. sure. If you want Christmas presents, man, if you, want, <laughs> you want to be invited for Thanksgiving. Uh, this is a touchy one, uh, but a very, very, very good question. Because as you start taking on other people's money, uh, things do change. When it's your own, it's a little less stress. Uh, and, and so I, I belong, I used to belong to three country clubs. It was a little excessive. I, I dropped two of them. Now I just have the one, but I have friends that would go to those country clubs and they raise a bunch of money all the time. And you know what? They would go there or they play golf and the guys are always like, how's my best for da, da, da. I'm like, listen, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. I, I want to go there and relax. So I never raised money that way, but this is no different. So what happens is there are, as you stated there are deals that that um that go bad and um and you just need to be prepared for that well it's not even deals that go bad but sometimes you have investors that are like oh my gosh something happened i need my money do, you know all that the time kind of thing yeah like too. life happens so so uh, the answer was do do i do it as an investment or do it as a loan they're very very different so um, if you do it as a, you don't really need to do it as a loan because there's a lot of hard money out there that'll give you all kinds of cash right now for real estate at, you know, call it six, seven, eight, nine percent. Um, you, you know, it's probably better off as an investment and in getting a, a, a lower, um, you know, because it, it's again, it's cost of capital, um, you know, and and, and so. Uh, and, and also, if the if the thing does really well, you want them to benefit. the The issue becomes the transparency, and and uh, and 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 being able to sit down with somebody, which I've had to do in my life, sit down with friends and family and say, "Listen, this did not go the way that I thought it was going to go." Uh, back in the early two thousands, mm -hmm. I had I had had that conversation. I still remember that conversation. So, it's a it's a judgment call. And uh, so I appreciate the question. And, and also, if you are going to syndicate, um, yes, you have to have the proper documents. I, I as you guys know, Mauricio Rold is going to be one of our advisors. He's already done five videos. Those are coming out. He's a great guy to, to that's that's called a PPM, a private place memorandum, all those kinds of things. And you want to make sure that they're accredited. Definitely. Um, and just so you know, you're getting involved in their finances and that's always a little bit complicated. So keep it in mind. So John from premium has a good question. He said he wants to market investors to buy a single family house. And what kind of interest rates should he pay the investors? He's hearing four to 10%, but how do you decide a fair rate? <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> four to 10. I would say yes. <laughs> I'm, yeah. just, I'm joking. Um, you know, um, it's all negotiable. So there are plenty of groups out there that will finance you for eight, nine, 10%. Like they're all over the place. It's a super competitive business. If you can find money for less than, you know, great. I, I would definitely do that. But it, it really has mostly to do with the cost of capital. So debt and equity are the exact same thing. They're just called something different and they're priced different. It's, you know, my money and my wallet and her money and her wallet is the exact same money. Um, and I can lend it out in the form of debt or I can give it to somebody in the form of equity or I can give it to somebody as a loan, you know, in, in the form of, of debt securitized against the property. There's lots of things I can do, but it's all about the cost of the money. Definitely. And Mr. Wright um, on our last question has an interesting approach. He said, ask your family how they'll feel if they lose money. If they get uneasy, don't do it. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. It's I, I've intentionally not had my family involved in my own stuff. Yeah. You know, and it just gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to complicate it. And um, so it's just easier. <laughs> Yilu from premium wants to know other than a lower rate, are there any first, uh, are there any other perks for first time home buyers? That I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are, I know that there's all kinds of programs coming out right now to incentivize, uh, you know, affordable housing and, and there's programs and I think they're kind of city and County and state driven, but the answer is I know they're out there, but I just don't know all of them. 
Definitely. Um, okay. So our last question is from Shobha. I hope I'm pronouncing that right on premium. They said that they have a few single family rental properties in Fort Lauderdale that have almost doubled in value since they bought them in 2013. They want to sell them and reinvest the profit profits into a multifamily syndication, but they're a little confused on what to do. I wouldn't do it. Okay. And that's what I do. Like I am a multifamily syndicator, but I think you should re cash out, refinance, put just enough debt on there, hold those assets. Do not, um, you're, you know, unless you can perfectly 1031 into that 1031 exchange, as you guys means that, um, uh, you know, uh, you can roll all those profits into, um, into something tax free if they even take 1031. Here's the thing. If you're going to do it, make sure that you have the asset picked first. <laughs> Don't yeah. sell and then have the, the, the gun against your head on trying to place the money. That's the biggest issue people have is, and, and if you just sell, you're going to have depreciation recapture, you're going to have capital gains. And the issue, as you pointed out, is going to be what, what to do next. Now, I'm sure this is driven by even though you didn't say day-to-day uh, -day management stuff, you know, um, and, um, you know, just like you have, right. You, you yep. have a number of rentals and, and, and sometimes you're like, Oh my gosh, I got, I think one, one week you got three HOA letters in, in one week on I three did. different assets. So, you know, it happens. And, uh, but if you've doubled the amount, um, I think personally, you guys should hold on to those and scoop some of the equity and make sure that it still is profitable and use some of that for a syndication. I would start slow. In other words, I wouldn't sell all that, put all your eggs in one basket and go to a multi, uh, uh, into a syndication. What I would do is I would just get like say a hundred grand out of there. And, and then give that to somebody else. If you and, sell, yeah, if you sell it Yeah, that way you still have your assets. Uh, that way, it's called velocity of money. You're actually harvesting the money that the properties have already produced. You still own the assets, so you get all the tax benefits. Hopefully, they're all rented and you still have the cash flow. And you've taken some of that money and stuck it into a syndication. And, and the, you know, what syndication and who and the fees and all that stuff is a whole different topic. But um, uh, that's what I would do. I would hold the assets and scoop a little bit and, and invest a little bit, not very much. When people invest with us, some of them have a lot of money. They give me a hundred grand almost always at first. And I want to right. see what this guy's all about. We want to see what this property's all about. We want to see what this company's all about. And then the next investment could be 500 to a million, let's say. So, you know, test it first. Don't cash out and then dump it all. That's not a good strategy. And Scott S is saying that too. He said, I have a guy who did, I know a guy who did that. He sold it first and now he can't find a property that meets the exchange criteria yeah. and he's panicking Yeah, because you only have what, six months or something. You actually have 90 days 90 to days. Um, identify and six months to close. So it's, it's, you don't want that pressure. Trust me. Um, you don't. And, and so there are, and this is odd, but we, we've had situations where Ross and I have decided to sell something, let's say, we as the seller have a clause that we can actually delay the closing as the seller, which is not very common, <laughs> but, but it's all about saving tax. So we want, until we find and identify something, the hardest part is finding a deal. You guys, as you know, especially in today's market. So if you have something that's doubled, um, I would be careful. Definitely. Well, that wraps up the show for today. Make sure you guys tune into our webinar. It's going to be on wholesaling, kenmacroy.com forward slash webinar. Um, we provide really great information for free. Great way to get started if you don't have any money. Also, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. We do these lives every single Monday at 11 o'clock uh, Arizona time. And we'll see you guys yeah, next week. Yeah, thanks guys. As always, great questions today. Watch Zillow. <laughs>